Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I get, uh, I'm the, as Matt said, the New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer. And so I would like to add my welcome to those of you who've come from distances, India, other places around the world, around Australia. It's wonderful to have you here in Sydney. And we have turned on one of the rare days this summer that is actually warm and sunny. So enjoy it. Um, I get asked to give a lot of speeches. And generally, the office stacks them up, and we, we decide which one. Of course, Trevor, anything to do with the Faculty of Science here at Sydney you know, comes right to the top of the list. This one, there was no hesitation at all. I just sort of flicked a, as soon as I saw it, I, I flicked an email back to Matt. Um, because this is something that I've been passionate about for a long time, since I think it, I think it goes back to Richard Jefferson walking into my office at Adelaide. And it says, Richard, the great patriarch of open science, is sitting there in the back. Um, looking tropical, um, is came in and talked to me about the patent lens and the great work he was doing on uh, breeding seeds and dealing with the whole issue of patents in a very open way, um, had been for many years, and has really taken a lead both around the world, but in particular in Australia, really got us thinking about it and got us very much involved with things like creative commons, science commons and so on. And that's been a really big part of it. So you, you see reflections, I think, and I think Richard, a lot of it is down to you, of things like the move to open government and things that were in the review of the innovation system in 2008. And Australia, of course, has moved to a lot of um, legislation about open access to data. And I think a lot of that has connected to some of these, these movements. So in New South Wales, for example, you get HIPAA, the Government Information Brackets Public Access Act of 2009, which makes all New South Wales government data mandatorily available with some um, reservations, things like privacy. But you know, the onus is on the government to not give it to you, rather that uh, by default it, it's all open. And that's, that's become typical of most Australian <laughs> jurisdictions. That's the more general issue about open data, open science, particularly what the, the application here on drugs for malaria I think is very exciting, both because the malaria problem is a major one and this typifies how you bring this approach to bear on some of the areas of greatest impact in terms of people's lives but also economic impact. Because if you can deal with these chronic, long-term chronic diseases, you can um, change the economies of the poorest nations in the world. And um, just to indicate that as part of the whole movement in, in the open movement, I, I, uh, I do what I preach in this area. For quite some years, I've been on the board of the Development Gateway. And in recent years, I've been its chair. And it's an organization headquartered in Washington and a participant organization in Brussels, which is not about malaria, but it's about um, open source uh, uh, software for transparency in the developing, developing world and how we get through the, the barrier of software patents to make sure we make transparency software freely available. But the other thing about Development Gateway is we have a, a product, Sunia, which is about sharing information, an information platform for supporting the open movement generally and, and just getting information. So that if Development Gateway can do anything to support what you're doing here today, Matt, in just giving it airtime around things which you and I can talk about that separately. Um, I see this at the risk of sort of sounding like putting a whole hodgepodge of things on the table. Um, I see this sort of work and the discussions today as part of a wider series of things about how we're doing science and research more generally in a very different way. And I was delighted to see in the sort of general directions for today that you're going to be talking about not just the great the malaria problem itself and how you're going to tackle it, but also some of the problems that come up as we move to new science um, and more sort of open innovation and open science things, which you read Matt's blog, it's one of the best explanations I've ever seen of the difference between open innovation and open science. The whole things are not the same thing, but they are connected issues. And some of them have their roots in things quite a long time ago. One thing that is not open science, but is 
open innovation, goes back to the American Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, and then it's got called DARPA and then back to ARPA, which is really about using competition, funding teams, fully funding them really well, putting them in competition to solve really big problems. And you know, things like the microwave oven and um, the internet are really due to DARPA funding. And you, you, think, you see it in more recent things like uh, Google Translate. The, the big translation problem was a three-time ARPA project. They tried this big problem from the mid-60s and came back to it several times. And the, the one in the early 2000s was the most successful. And the minute it finished and the winner was declared, Google employed the whole team that had, had won it. Um, but you've seen the Obama administration move the ARPA model away from just uh, defense-related problems, generally um, sanitize problems so that they they could be worked on without security clearances. But it, there's now ARPA-E in the United States, which is about breakthroughs in energy, particularly renewable energy. And Obama tried to get a new project called ARPA-ED up in the last budget, and of course it failed. It wasn't funded, but it's a great idea to use the same ideas. It's big, well-specified problems, big teams running in competition to try and solve them. Um, to, to see if they could break through on some big education problems. Other examples of sort of the open approach, but more from the competitive angle, are things like the Australian invented Kaggle, um, which is about open data competitions. And um, we were proud of the New South Wales government to, to use Kaggle to look at the M4 freeway, at the, uh, what travel for anyone who's Sydney aware would know that travelling on our freeways is not always the fastest experience you could have. And so this was, we put out 18 months of data through Kaggle and said to people, we want an algorithm which will say at any time of the day, night, any day of the week, if you get onto the M4 at one spot, what time will you get off it? And through Kaggle, you offer a small amount of money. We offered $10,000 and we got, what does it carry, 360 or 364 um, proposals over a period of six weeks. And of course, because it's open, you can all watch each other's solutions working out. And it was won by, I think, a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon from somewhere in South America. And the second person was a Harvard medical student. Anyway, we got the algorithms. It would have cost us you know, over a million dollars to build the software and traffic authority. But we, we bought the first three algorithms and you know, have got get up on the, on the web at some time from the RTA. You, you get things like ResearchGate, get Science Exchange. Um, where people have over, have ways of uh, advertising on the web to subcontract their research. You know, they get a grant and then they need to get it done, so they throw it over and are willing to pay other people. You get commercial ventures like Innocentive and Nine Sigma, which put out problems and then say, you know, somebody, if you crack it, you will get this this large amount. But science. But I think what's closer to the much more supportive of the open science issue, where you are really sharing data, both good results, bad results, like results that failed, and sharing somebody will do the development of the compound, somebody else will do the testing of it, um, and bring old other research that exists to bear on it. Things like science commons, creative commons, and the neuro commons, I think, are much more, much closer into that. But all of these things are part of a, are throwing up, I think, exciting ways of doing science and exciting not just because they're fun to do and it's interesting to get people sharing and not forever locked up in not talking because they're publishing or patenting in a way that they don't want to share. But it's interesting, I think, in, for, for Australia, which is, has a great economy but has had very zero productivity growth for the last eight years or so. And so it's quite worrying. While today is good, long term we could be in trouble. Things like this, I think, offer the biggest hope for, for very big breakthroughs in, in productivity growth for us and for how we work with, with other countries. In supporting these things, I think, as a computer science person, I think one of the most important things, too, is how we manage the infrastructure behind the what becomes very largely a big data problem a heterogeneous data problem where we've got lots of different sources of data and information and we need to bring them together. Partly human assisted but sometimes we want to automate this as much as possible. And I was looking forward to seeing Richard here 
um, today and was then quite amazed to hop out of a cab at NICTI yesterday, National ICT Australia, and run into him there and find he's working with NICTA. That the work between this sort of, your work in, in chemistry, biology, and the ICT world has to come ever closer. And the New South Wales government would like to support this in various ways. We already put a lot of funding into NICTA and work closely with it. How might NICTA support the work talked about today? We also support e-research very strongly through um, Intersect, and of course, Intersect um, links in with ANS, and we're delighted that uh, Andrew can look. Andrew, are you here? Sorry. I'm without the famous glasses, I promise that I'd wear. But it's great that, you know, ANS is here and Intersect. Um, somebody here. Thank you, and thank you for coming again, you know, sort of blindly looking into this thing. Um, but Intersect has been, the New South Wales government has strongly supported Intersect along with the federal government and others as a way of building platforms for e-research, and that's, again, I think an important part of what can, can happen here. And we're wondering between Intersect ANS and NICTA how we might interact nationally with the, with the work on malaria and more generally on the drug discovery activity. Um, so good luck with today. I'm very much looking forward to what you'll do. Um, I, I did want to mention that as well as Matthew and the team here and the, and the very creative general faculty of science, you've got another resource floating around on this campus in Michael Spence who many of us here knew well before he was vice chancellor and thought of him as somebody in the sort of open creative commons, open commons uh, area. And, um, and I know he's a very big supporter of this, this whole space. So good luck. I'm sorry I can't say all the day, but I'll, I'll turn on my computer. So if it's time I'm in the office, I'll be, I'll be watching. But do let me know what I can do. Thank you. <laughs>